Our scripture today is from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. I don't have chapter 5 listed there, but it's chapter 5, verse 14 to 24. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 14 to 24. Let's pray. We thank you for this chance to hear your word, to be able to read it together with one another, to know, Lord, that your spirit is leading and guiding us. Help us, Lord, to lean upon you, to be guided by you, to listen, and to hear what it is you want us to. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 to 24. Hear now God's word. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the things I absolutely love about, about Jesus, about Christianity, is the amount of variety. When I look out here in the sanctuary and I'm able to see those who are on Zoom, I see represented so many different stories. It is beautiful, the amount of stories that I see here. To almost a certainty... No one person's experience is absolutely identical to another person's ex experience when it comes to how they have come to know Jesus. That's one of the beauties of it. However, there are similarities. There are things that, that we've experienced about God, God's goodness, God's love, God's grace. All those are quite similar in different ways. And so though we come to Christ differently, we experience similar things. Shows us the power and the goodness of, of God. One of the joys that I get with being uh, a pastor and being in the ministry uh, for as long as I have is all the different stories I've heard a, 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 along the, the, the way. The different stories of Jesus' love how that love was respected, uh, reflected in the lives of others. The experiences that people have, have lived and experienced in their own life. I love hearing stories of marriages are amongst my favorite. All the different ways that people have understood one another. One of my favorites is from a, a woman who... Uh, her husband had just passed, and I asked him, I asked her uh, what, what, if she could tell me anything about her husband, any kind of stories that she'd like to share, anything like, like that. And, um, and she said to me, she said, I, I loved my husband dearly, with all of my heart. She said, I, um, and, and, and he, he loved me dearly with all of his heart. She said, but if I had to do it over again, I don't think I would have picked him. <laughs> One of my favorite stories. They, they were such a wonderful Christian couple that to see them, you know that they loved e e each other. And when I told the, the story at the funeral, uh, her family, her kids laughed and laughed because they knew it was true. Um, 
We don't all look the same. We don't all act the same. We don't all have the same experiences. And, we, and our love that we love with one another is different. And so when we come to Jesus, that route that we take looks different. And when we grow closer to Christ, sometimes that disciple, and that's what that's called, that discipleship looks different. Before we talk about discipleship, though, we have to define discipleship. What, does, what is the definition of a disciple? Here's one of my favorites. <clears throat> well, here's an easy one, anyway. <clears throat> In general, a disciple is a person who is a pupil or an adherent of the doctrines of another, a follower. Uh, an example would be a disciple of Freud, one who follows the, teachers, the teachings of Freud. Uh, and here's another uh, definition of disciple, is any follower of Christ, they would be considered a disciple. Now, I would, I would argue against that. You can call yourself a Christian, but you're not necessarily a disciple. Here's a definition of disciple that I like. A disciple has been shown to be someone who follows the teachings, life, and aim of another until the person becomes like the master. Discipleship in Christian sense is the process of making someone become like Christ. The disciple of Christ is to become like Christ in everything. The idea of a disciple is someone who journeys to be closer and closer in relationship to that person whom they are a disciple to. For us as Jesus. We can call ourselves Christians, show up on church on Sunday, but that doesn't necessarily make us a disciple. A disciple denotes a journey, a way to grow closer, a way to grow in greater understanding of that whom we follow. And for us, it's Jesus. In order to do that, we then have to know Christ better. To know Christ more fully. To rely on Jesus more and more in our lives. And in order to do that, we need to know the teachings. And to be obedient, and to be obedient, we have to know what we need to be obedient to. All of this takes knowledge. All of this takes growth. Our scripture today that we had read covers these scriptures, 16, 17, and 18. I've read these before. They're very important to me. And I think that they're important to, could be important to all of us. They were important to John Wesley. You see, our, and, and you've heard me preach on this before, maybe a few times. John Wesley had this phrase, and it's not, it's not unique to him. But he had this phrase called Christian perfection. How many of you, you can raise your hands here, and if you're on Zoom, you can raise your hands on Zoom. How many of you feel like you have reached Christian perfection? No. No, no hands are raised here in the sanctuary, and I would doubt any, raised, any hands are raised on Zoom. And if you did, good. Christian perfection, as we understand it, and oftentimes define it ourselves, and why we don't raise our hands with any kind of certainty is to be a perfect Christian. And for us, that means to not sin. And we've all messed up. We've all sinned. We all fall short, uh, fall short, and we all continue to do so. I've sinned. In the past week, I pray one day that I don't. But until that day comes, I cannot say if with my definition that I have reached Christian perfection. In fact, when I think about reaching Christian perfection, honestly, I get tired thinking about it. I become weary thinking that I will never make it. Sometimes we can get down thinking, what's the point? John Wesley's idea of Christian perfection, though, was a slightly different and he used this scripture in order to kind of guide his thoughts. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Let 
If that's the idea of Christian perfection, I know of a few people in my life who have come pretty close to doing that. People in my life who it seems no matter what's going on, they're always rejoicing. They're always giving thanks for one thing or, or, or another. They get into a car accident with the deer, and they say, well, at least the deer died quick, and I'm o o o okay. Or they get into a car accident, and they hit the side of a wall, and the car becomes total, and they say, praise God, I have insurance. Able to give thanks in as many situations as comes up to them. Do you have people in your life where if you tell them to, you ask them to pray for something in, in your life, you know that they're going to? Or you know that, that they will say in that very moment, okay, let's pray together. John Wesley says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the definition of Christian perfection. Further than this, we cannot go. Short of this, we should not stop. But the beauty about the body of Christ is that we all look different. And so we rejoice always, and we should too, but that rejoicing looks different. Some of you are able to rejoice and praise God with hands uplifted, rocking back and forth, swaying to the beat of music. My hands only go this high. I can't rejoice like this. It's just not who I am. Sure, I can try, but man, I am uncomfortable. And I'm afraid that you are all staring at my arm, arm, armpits. That's what I'm thinking of right now. But I showered, so it's okay. Pray continually. We all pray, but each of us can pray diff, diff differently. Some people pray in the quiet of, of, of their, their, their room. Some people pray best when they're in their, their car. One of my favorite uh, stories, it's not true, was of uh, three pastors who were talking about the correct way to pray. One of them says you should always pray while you're on, on your, your knees. Other, another said you should pray with your hands held up in the sky, held up in the air, looking up at the sky, praying to God. Another said that you should be pray praying, laying prostrate upon the ground with your hands outstretched before you and your forehead tut, 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 touching the car carpet. And then a man who was sitting at the coffee counter in the restaurant overhearing these ministers talking about praying went over to them and saying, I will tell you the, the best prayer that I've ever prayed is when I fell down a well and my feet were high above me and my my head was looking down the well, and I prayed to God the best prayer right there and then. We all pray differently and at different times. Give thanks in all circumstances. And the way we give thanks looks different. Some of us shout it out for the world to hear, while others keep it quiet to ourselves. Neither of these are wrong. All of them are right. We each do things differently and grow closer to God diff differently. The important thing is, the extreme important thing is, is to find the best way that works for you. How do you draw closer to Jesus Christ? How do you worship God? I know that for many of you, singing is of the utmost importance and so vital to who you are when it comes to, to worship, worshiping Jesus. And that this time, the pandemic is so difficult on you because we can't worship God by singing to, 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 together. And that hurts. And you just want to sing a hymn. And for me, I'll be honest, it's not hurting me that bad. One, I can't sing anyway. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I sing at home. I sing songs from the 50s, 60s, and 90s. My kids wish I wouldn't. Singing's not that important to me. Worshiping God for me takes different forms. I can sing worshiping, I can worship God by singing, there's no doubt about that, but 
also one of my favorite ways of worshiping God is sitting down with someone and hearing their stories about how God has touched them. That's my favorite way of worshiping God. When I was at Jamonville, they had a practice of worshiping God. They, had, they worshiped God in so many different ways at Jamonville on their Wednesday night worship service. It was wonderful. Uh, one of the ways is they had an offering plate that they would invite the kids to place their offerings. And the offering plate was huge. It was like six feet around. I know, there's a difference between circumference and diameter, and I can't tell you which. But it was just huge. And, and you know how they encouraged the campers to, to give, give, give their off offering? By standing inside the offering plate. That's, that's cool. Because they would then offer themselves. And, and then they would be singing, there'd be liturgical dancing. They would invite the kids to come down front and start dancing to, 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 to the uh, music. And the whole time this was going on, there was someone off in the corner painting a picture. And during the entire worship service, this person wouldn't stop painting the picture and continue to do it. And at the end of the worship service, they would go to this person who was drawing, and they'd say, tell us what you were doing. And they would say, I was worshiping God. Their worship activity was art. Creativity. And they would explain why they painted this picture. Why they drew what they did and what it meant to them and what God means to them. And this is how they showed it. Knowing how it is we worship God and how it is we draw closer to God is, of, is so important because we do things differently. How many of you are journal writers? We have any journal writers here? Got a few. Any journal writers on Zoom? I assume we'll have a few. I can't see him. I tried writing a journal because my devotion life needs a lot of work. And so I sat down and I asked someone and I said, uh, how do you recommend I get into journaling? I knew this person was big into journaling. And they said, buy the best journal you possibly can. Make sure that when you look at it, it looks beautiful. He said, because the things that you write in it, you think will be crappy, but at least the journal looks good. So I bought myself a nice journal, started writing in it. I don't know where the journal is. I think I threw it at the bottom of a drawer or something. Never went back to it. But there are people who, for them, journaling helps. It's a way for them to unload and get everything out on the, the uh, page. Approach the scriptures in the way that works best for you. For some people, sitting down at night and reading the scripture a chapter a day is what works best for them. Being guided through a devotion is what works best for them. R reading one scripture and journaling about that one scripture is what works best for them. For me, it's reading a scripture and then driving in the car and talking out loud. That's what works best for me. For for me. Find that way. Discipleship for each person might look different. And so for the next few weeks, two weeks, what we're going to do is look at different ways to draw close, close, closer to uh, Jesus. We're going through a Bible study, and in that Bible study, uh, it talks about four pathways to Christ. One through Mark, one through Matthew, one through uh, Luke, and one through John. Now, I know I got those mixed up, but that's, that's the way that, that's the direction that, that, that they, they go. Next week, we're going to talk about the Markan and the Matthean way of drawing closer to, to, to Christ. The week after that, we're going to talk about the Lucan and the Johannine way of drawing close, close, closer to Christ. We are the church. One of the most important aspects of the church is discipleship. If we're not drawing closer to Jesus in our daily lives, what are we doing? Why are we worshiping God? Why are we calling ourselves Christians if we're not committed to devote ourselves to know Christ better and to know Christ as much as we possibly can? 
the pathway to get there is different for everyone. But I pray that we're able to find the path that God called us on and walk in. And know this, your path may be different from someone else's, but you're not alone walking it. We're with you. Christ is with you, especially every step of, 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 of the, the way. And so I pray that we walk it consistently, constantly. And if we stray, we pray for one another and work to, 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 to get back on. I leave you today with this benediction. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen and amen. Go in peace, and I hope you all have a blessed, wonderful week.